Uh, so we at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy regard this as a bittersweet moment. It's sweet to have uh, Fabrice back. It's bitter that he's left us after two years and defected to the Hoover Institution down the way. But while he was at the Washington Institute, he, uh, much of his work uh, was on uh, this magnus opus, the Sectarianism in Syria's Civil War, a geopolitical study featuring 70 original maps. And indeed, it uh, is a truly beautiful book with uh, 70 different maps in it, uh, as well as a very interesting text. And uh, I wish to commend it to you. And uh, you are the lucky chosen few. Uh, each of you is going to get a copy of this as you walk out. And uh, Fabrice will be sitting there uh, signing copies if you're interested. Um, I uh, argued unsuccessfully in favor of putting a $75 price tag on this <laughs> uh, because uh, that's how much it would cost you if, if this were published by a commercial publisher. Uh, it's not cheap to print uh, 70 color maps, let me tell you. Uh, so anyway, w you will get one copy, <laughs> right, <laughs> as you walk out. Um, and you have to stay the whole time. And you have to stay the whole time. That's right. <laughs> So, um, furthermore, our, our timing is perfect because this came back from the, the printers yesterday, which was the same day that uh, – the day after that uh, Fabrice came back from three weeks in Syria. He's been the guest of Doctors Without Borders uh, touring the uh, Democratic Federation of North Syria, as it styles itself, uh, from uh, – uh, all across from Manbij to Raqqa to – uh, Hasaka, to you name it. So we will be also hearing from Fabrice uh, uh, an update about how things are going in that part of Syria where U.S. forces are uh, committed and, uh, and active. And then uh, after uh, Fabrice's remarks, uh, we will be hearing of some comments and, uh, from uh, Andrew Tabler, who is the Martin J. Gross Fellow here at the Washington Institute and the author In the Lion's Den, an eyewitness account of Washington's battle with Syria uh, and uh, one of Washington's most um, respected and sought after analysts of the Syrian situation. So uh, thank you all for coming and uh, Fabrice, the podium is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Patrick and Andrew. First, of course, I would like to express my deep gratitude to all the Washington Institute team who helped me and supported me during my, my stay here. Uh, this study is uh, the result of an immense uh, teamwork among the institutes. I would like uh, to thank especially uh, George Lopez, who is not here, but who did a wonderful job improving the quality of, uh, of the text, and of course, Mary Horan. Uh, who spent an extraordinary amount of time uh, redesigning the editing and the maps. Uh, Syria is a difficult subject with violent polemics. Uh, at the beginning of the, the Syrian emperorism, I wrote that Assad will not fall easily because of the sectarianisms. And many times for that, I was accused to be uh, pro-Assad. Uh, I tried just to explain the reality of the Syrian society and how the Assad regime used this reality to keep the power. The idea of a general uprising in Syria like in Tunisia was an illusion because the Syrian society was too fragmented. Therefore, any scholar who tackles Syria needs the support of the institution that host him, and uh, I have always found this support at the Washington Institute because I think that the Washington Institute uh, sees the Middle East as is existing and not as we would like uh, to dream it, and it's very, very important. So this book is also the result of 25 years of research in Syria, 10 years on the ground, and dozens of travel in this country, even during the war. My last travel, as uh, Patrick said, uh, was uh, last uh, January. I, I visited the northern Syria, uh, Raqqa, Manbej, Kobane, and um, I have in this book uh, a special chapter about the Kurdish area. Um, I'm very pessimistic about the chance of success of the democratic uh, northern federation of Syria, uh, also because of the sectarianisms, but uh, we could speak about that later. later. 
So sectarianism is the backbone of the Syrian society. Since my first research in Syria in 1990, I noticed that the religious, sectarian and tribal identity were most important than the Syrian identity. That does not mean that Syri Syrians are not nationalists, but their first identity and their first social network <coughs> if, uh, is sectarian. This social organization is not necessarily violent, but it could become a source of violence in case of conflict, as we have seen during this war. It's a murdered identity, as wrote the Lebanese writer Amin Malouf. When I finished my PhD in, in 2000, the Alawite on the Power and Political Geography, I, it was very clear for me that Syria would explode after about 10 years. At that time, I wrote that Syria was at the, in the same situation that uh, Yugoslavia at the death of Tito. And um, the country could continue to work 10 years, but it will explode if we had an economic crisis, if we had something, and the sectarian cleavage will be uh, the, 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 the most important cleavage, and it will be very violent because of the sectarianisms. The sectarianism is not something new in Syria. It's not appears with the war. It's much more old. Uh, it's come from the Middle Age, from the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it's not something created uh, by the war. Officially, the Basism wanted to eliminate the sectarianisms and create a new Homo Syrianicus, the Arab Syrian, but that failed uh, quickly. That failed because the Ba'ath Party had been created by the minority to protect themselves against the majority. This is the base of the construction of the Ba'athism. Of course, you have the Ba'athist ideology, but according to my experience, it was just a smoke screen, just something uh, created to protect the Alawite, the Christian, the Druze, against the domination of the Arab Sunni. And in Iraq, of course, we can have the same thing. The Ba'ath Party was created by the Sunni Arabs to protect them against the majority, the Shia, uh, the Shia population. So quickly after the Ba'ath Revolution in 1963, the minorities eliminated the Sunni from the power. Then the Alawite eliminated the other minorities. And in 1970, an Alawite clan with Hafez al-Assad eliminated the other Alawite. Uh, you can read the book of uh, Nicholas Van Damme, uh, Struggle for uh, Power in Syria. He explained very well uh, this, uh, this situation. And if Hafez al-Assad succeeded and stayed at the power, it's because he was realistic. He didn't want to change the society, but use the sectarian division to reinforce his power. And he put systematically Alawite, and especially the Kelbiin, his, his tribe, his Alawite tribe, to the key position. He was enough clever to integrate uh, the other minorities and some Sunni in the power, like Mustafa Tlas, for instance, the Sunni Ministry of Defense. In, in, his, in his power, in his Asabiya, because we have, if we want to understand the political power in Syria, we have to come back to Ibn Khaldun, uh, who explain uh, what is the backbone of the power in, uh, in, in the political Islam, in political Arab world. However, uh, he kept a huge Alawite control uh, on the army and the secret service. The Syrian army didn't explode in 2011 because the majority of the officers are Alawite. The highlight unit, like the Republican Guard, uh, are Alawite, and also especially the aviation. That's why we haven't seen, as in Libya, pilots leave Syria or refuse to shell the civilian like in, in Libya too, you have just one exception, a Druze pilot would affect. But the other pilot did their job as the commandment asked, because they were mostly Alawite. Since the beginning of the war, the sectarian cleavage was very clear. However, most of the analysts thought that it was like the Tunisian uprising, a revolt of all people against the dictator. In 2011, um, I wrote an article, Geography of the Syrian War, um, to try to explain the sectarian roots of the conflict. But if you want to understand the conflict, we have to come back 
to, to this map of the sectarian and ethnic distribution of, of Syria. Of course, it was not the only parameter because we have uh, different cleavage, like center periphery was very, very important too. However, even the uh, cleavage between the center and the periphery is the result of the sectarian policy the sect, uh, sectarian policy of planning during 40 years. If the eastern part of Syria is not developed, it was because Hafez al-Assad uh, didn't want to uh, improve the economic situation of the Kurdish area, to push the Kurds to come to Damascus, to come to Aleppo, to break the uh, Kurdish uh, unity, and to reduce the proportion of Kurds in Hasake province, for instance. So, uh, and I can explain the uh, urban planning, the regional planning, also uh, according to uh, sectarian priorities. It's not, uh, okay. No, it's not work. <laughs> it's better. <laughs> um, so in, in Dera province, the population is Arab Sunni with only a few uh, thousand of Christians. Uh, and of course, in this area, we have not seen sectarian riots, sectarian violence, because the population is Arab Sunni. But when we see uh, but, but the, the uprising stopped just at the border of the Jebel Druze, uh, you had no, you had no um, contamination of the uprising in the Jebel Druze in 2011. And uh, in addition, during all the war, Druze remained loyal to Assad regime because they were afraid about the Sunni revenge. You have just a few thousand of Druze who joined the Free Syrian Army and we, they, they fought against uh, the Druze pro-regime uh, militia. But at the end of 2013, al-Nusra, sentenced the Druze militia in the Free Syrian Army to death in Derara, accused to be traitors. Um, in a sectarian civil war, you have to follow your community or you have to leave the country. You have no choice. You can, in, in Latakia, uh, in Banyas, in Homs, uh, when you had uh, some uh, demonstration against the regime, the, the demonstrators were uh, Arab Sunni. At the beginning of the, uh, of beginning of, of, uh, the, the praising, you had some Alawites, some Christians who joined the demonstration. But quickly, they left, uh, they left the demonstration because of the sectarian character of the protestation. Um, moreover, nearly all the Alawites were for the state, in the army, in the secret service, in the administration. I saw that nearly n more than 90% of the Alawites were with the Syrian state, uh, in, uh, in were working with the Syrian state in 2011. They get their jobs thanks to the political clientelism, and they know that if Assad loses the power, they will lose their position because the new Sunni regime will change the staff, of course. It was the main reason that prevented the Alawite to join the opposition, and moreover, the Alawites were afraid by the growing of the anti-Shia feeling among the opposition. All the people have the memory of the sectarian massacre of uh, the, the uh, 19th century in uh, uh, 1860, the uprising of the Muslim brother in, uh, in 1980, uh, the Lebanese civil war, and of course, the, the Iraqi war. The minority know very well that they will have to do the choice between the coffin and the suitcase if they don't support the Assad regime. And they don't want to take the risk to support the opposition, like did uh, the, the, the Druze who joined in the Free Syrian army, and they have been obliged to, to leave uh, for Jordan uh, after two years. Um, and it was very clear when uh, on the map of the conflict that uh, Syria was clearly divided between minorities, uh, um, the minorities and the Sunni Arabs uh, majorities. 
On this map I, of the conflict in April 2013, when the regime was very weak, uh, I put a layer of the uh, different sect. And you can see uh, that the regime in, uh, in pink um, is only controlling at that time the area where the, where the minority are the majority of the population. It's the coast, it's central Syria around the Homs, the Jebel Druze, of course, and Damascus. Damascus because the minority was very important and also because it was very important for the regime uh, since uh, 1970 to keep Damascus. And uh, Hafez al-Assad said all the time, would keep Damascus, keep Syria. And um, Damascus is a, um, a castle, a military castle uh, for, uh, for the regime. On the north, you can see that the, uh, in orange, that the Kurdish militia are controlling, of course, uh, the Kurdish uh, area. And in, uh, in green, uh, northern Syria was a stronghold of the opposition because it's, of course, an Arab-Sunni stronghold. Uh, after between Homs and Damascus, uh, the situation was more confused. But uh, when you, you put the layer of the sectarian uh, identity and the layer of the different front, it was very clear that we had in a sectarian uh, civil war. The example of Damascus is also very interesting. The revolt came from the um, poor Arab Sunni periphery, the eastern Ghouta, Souf Ghouta, and um, Kaboun, the poor uh, neighborhood of, uh, of Damascus. But the rebel has never succeeded to encircle Damascus. Since 1970, Hafez al-Assad broke the Sunni belt implanting or, or encouraging minority settlement around Damascus. In blue, you have the main place where uh, have been settled the, the minority uh, around Damascus. It was in military camps um, at the east of Damascus, uh, like Qura uh, uh, el-Assad or um, Masak and Dimas. Uh, it's a military camps where the, the, the soldiers are coming, uh, came from, from the coast, they are Alawite. And you have also uh, some uh, uh, Druze and Christian stronghold like Jeremana. Here. Jeremana, uh, very strategic localization between the eastern and southern Ruta and along the airport motorway. And during the, until 2013, uh, the, the opposition succeed to nearly encircle uh, south and east of Damascus, but they never succeed to take Jeramana. They never succeed to take Jeramana because uh, the Druze and the Christian never accepted uh, the, the, the presence of the, uh, the Free Syrian Army in their city. And uh, by the contrary, they, uh, they supported the, the, the regime. And I think it was... Uh, one of the ex key explanations why Assad uh, succeeded to, 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 uh, to keep Damascus. And this map is the result of, the, of his father's strategy to implement, to settle minority around Damascus to break the uh, Arab Sunni belt around the city. We can... Uh, if you want to keep the power, you have to settle loyal population in the city and in the strategic crossroad. You have also to expel non-loyal population from the strategic place. The ethnic cleansing is, a, in this case, a strategic cleansing. And today, at the level, level of the Near East, when we see Iran building roads, uh, routes between, uh, between Iran and, and Lebanon, it's exactly the same strategy. Uh, Tel Afar, a Shia stronghold uh, at the west of Mosul, will be a crossroad, uh, very important for, uh, for, for Iran. Iran is, um, uh, res is respecting this strategy uh, of, um, of uh, supporting uh, the, the Shia minority and even the other mi mi minority against the, uh, the Arab Sunni uh, majority and try to implement, of course, um, new population in very strategic place like Qusair, 
um, uh, close to, to homes to uh, reinforce his, his presence uh, in the area and to protect uh, the, uh, the Iranian roads. But um, the, of course, the sectarianism is not, uh, is not enough to, to understand the, the Syrian civil war. You have also a social cleavage. I haven't um, developed too much in my book because it was not the, the goal of the book. But we have to mention that the so social cleavage exists too. Aleppo, for instance, is a very good example of this uh, social cleavage. The Sunni Arab middle class and upper class do not support a protestation coming from the Sunni Arab people, for poor Sunni Arab people. Uh, they are afraid about to lose their house, their money. Uh, the pillage of Chernajar industrial zone by the Free Syrian Army in 2012 uh, gave an argument to the wealthy Arab Sunni class do not support the rebellion. That's why Western Aleppo was under the control of the Syrian government, the wealthy area of the city, the urban area of the city, and Eastern Aleppo, the poorest area of the city, and also um, where you have the population coming from the countryside, was uh, for, the, uh, for the rebellion. And uh, the front line didn't change nearly until uh, 2016. The other cleavage that you have, it's very important in, in, the, in the Arab population, it's the tribal, uh, the tribal cleavage. Uh, Eastern Syria is divided in many tribes. Um, you have no more uh, tribal federation with millions of people uh, like uh, one century ago. Um, but uh, at the level of the tribe, uh, 10,000, 50,000 people, the solidarity is still working. Um, tribe follow the stronger and work in their own interest. Traditionally, they supported the regime, and the Free Syrian Army was the, the worst enemy of the tribe because they, they came from people who were not involved the, uh, in, in, in the tribe. And by the contrary, we wanted to uh, reverse uh, the, the power and they accuse the tribal leader uh, to be uh, for the regime, and of course it was uh, it was true. With Daesh, uh, the relation between the tribe was more peaceful, but now with the PYD in northern Syria, it's not easy. The tribal leaders are upset uh, with the Kurdish uh, uh, governance, who try to promote a new Arab generation against the tribal structure. By the contrary, the regime always supported the tribal leadership. And um, I was in Manbej uh, two weeks ago, uh, and the, the example of Manbej is very clear. The YPG controls the Manbej Civilian Council. The most important tribal leaders are out the council. In mid-January, mid the tribe demon demonstrated against the uh, Manbej Civilian Council. And uh, the tribe today reject all decisions taken by the Manbej uh, Civilian Council. The YPG and the PKK are against the tribal leadership because they want also to promote a new generation coming from the poorest people able to challenge the traditional leadership. Therefore, the tribal leadership ask support to the Assad regime. When I was in Manbej, all the tribal leaders went to Damascus and then have been to such a conference. They negotiate their political position when the Syrian army will come back in Manbej. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, the same thing in, uh, in Raqqa area. So, as I said, you had come back from northern Syria, from Raqqa, uh, where the situation is nearly the same than in, in Manbej, um, according to the, the political uh, relation. Um, the federal Federation of Northern Syria where Arab, Kurds, and others will live in perfect tolerance and equality is a dream. In reality, it's a Kurdish project, and uh, the Arabs are uh, upset about this inversion of, of power. In Raqqa, you can see many cycles like that, YPG, Apo, in an in a Arab city, and uh, people don't like that. They cannot speak too much about that because of course, uh, the YPG is powerful, but uh, they feel humiliated but, uh, with uh, that, uh, uh, that slogan. And on each 
uh, municipality uh, in the Euphrat uh, Valley, where the population is 100% Arabs, you can have, uh, you have Baladiyet uh, Shaabe fi al Karame. it's a village close to, to Raqqa, and it's also written in, in Kurdish. Um, it's a bad. Uh, it's it, it's a bad idea from the uh, from the YPG uh, to to do that, because people are uh, very very upset about the intrusion of the Kurdish language uh, in their uh, in their life. Um, PKK veteran coming from Kandil uh, have the power and control everything, even in Manbej, the the Manbej Civil Council or the Raqqa Civil Council uh, are dominated by uh, the black men of the, of the PKK. Um, in the local administration, you have always a Syrian Kurds who is the president or vice president, even if there is nearly no Kurd in the area. And uh, most of them are coming from Kamishli or Kobane. Um, like before, um, the, the people who had the power in, in Raqqa, Manbej, or Kamishli were coming from Latakia or Tartus. Uh, and they were uh, Alawites. The Arabs are associated to the power, but more like puppets. The Kurds think their ideology is superior to the Arabs, and they have to show them the path, to show them the life, the light. The election and the local democracy is a joke. And the political system is very centralized, and there is no discussion possible. For the moment, the population accepts the situation because the YPG uh, provides security uh, and there is nearly uh, no protection. Uh, but uh, the population is uh, complaining uh, more and more. Therefore, the tension between Arab and Kurds are rising. Uh, because the Kurds are not, uh, of course, the majority in all northern Syria. Uh, they are the majority in Afrin, Kobane, Kamishli, but in the other place, uh, like Raqqa, uh, there is no Kurds. Uh, and uh, in uh, Tel Abiyad or uh, in, in Manbej, there is only few uh, Kurdish uh, minority. And now with the war uh, in Afrin, uh, the Arabs uh, don't want to fight for the Kurdish project. Uh, it's a war between Erdogan and the Kurds. Uh, the Arabs would join the SDF, and who are probably the majority today in the SDF, uh, are not in the SDF to fight the Turkish army. If they join the SDF, most of them, it's for the salary, because they have no other option to survive. Um, and, but the Arabs who are in the YPG in, have nearly no chance to have a promotion because all the officers are Kurds, like before the officer was Alawite. Um, conclusion, uh, if you want to understand really the Syrian civil war, we have to understand the sectarianism. Ideology is a smokescreen. The sectarian identity and allegiance are stronger than, than political in, in Syria. The coexistence could be peaceful in case of political crisis, but the sectarian cleavage uh, reappear quickly. Yes, the Syrian uprising was peaceful and multi-sectarian at the beginning, but only during the first weeks of the first month maximum. Then the sectarian antagonisms wake up, wake up uh, dangerously. The Syrian regime used the sectarian antagonisms, however, it did not need uh, to put too much oil on the fire because the sectarian violence wake up naturally. In northern Syria, Assad regime is just waiting that the Arab population reject the Kurdish force. The Arab Hungary is raising with the economic crisis. And I think that if US want really to stay in northern Syria, uh, US has to invest not only in stabilization, but also in reconstruction to prevent sectarian tension. I don't think he could suppress the sectarian tension, but if at minimum people can have uh, a normal life, the economy could work normally, you can reduce uh, the, the sectarian uh, tension. Uh, I do not 
I don't know if uh, uh, it will be enough. However, if there is no Marshall Plan for the area, I'm afraid that the Syrian army will come back in Raqqa and Monbej before the end of the year. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, um, and um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, uh, I always like to talk about Syria, however depressing it usually is, um, and it's a real honor to be up here um, with, uh, with Fabrice today. Uh, Fabrice was a colleague here with us at the Institute for two years. Uh, there were a lot of uh, ups and downs in the Syrian war um, during that time. Uh, in fact, at the time that we brought uh, Fabrice here to the Institute, the, um, the prospects of the regime weren't looking too good. Uh, and we were looking at a fragmented Syria, um, one that is in de facto partition um, going forward. Um, and then shortly after Fabrice's arrival uh, here at the Institute, uh, Russia uh, intervened um, dramatically in the war uh, after a, the initial um, intervention of Iran in terms of supporting Shia militia and so on. Um, and, uh, and we were off in a very different direction uh, in terms of the war. And Fabrice's pieces here at the Institute, I think, did a very good job of mapping out and, and describing um, the, not only the regime's counteroffensives and their sort of uh, divide and rules uh, tactics, uh, but specifically those that the Russians and the Iranians were, um, were supporting. So in reading this book, which was, I think, a great compilation of both his policy watches as well as um, his you know, previous work, I think the, the book does an excellent job. Um, it, um, and, it, and of course, with maps, everything is a lot easier, especially given the complexity of the Syrian war. Um, but I think it does a tremendous job um, of showing um, how the regime was successfully able to use its divide and rule strategy, which it has been for decades, uh, to hold on uh, inside uh, of Syria. Now, in reading this, however, um, and as detailed as it is, and I took this book, and I'll explain this in a minute, as someone who feels their job is to understand and critique and to better U.S. foreign policy, um, I think in terms of um, looking at this book, I, I, I don't think, um, uh, I, I think it's important to point out um, that uh, during this entire process, um, where this sort of ruthless strategy was unleashed, um, Assad received many breaks, um, um, not only from the United States in the famous, um, in the famous red line um, incident, um, but also um, the degree to which Russia and Iran were willing to support uh, this agenda inside of Syria. Um, and I think that um, because of Russian and Iranian support is a large reason why this was so successful. I don't think that this particular version of tyranny was inevitably going to be the winner in Syria. Certainly, we, we didn't know that during the, uh, the, during the war here at the Institute um, or even during Fabrice's time here at the Institute. Um, but, um, but, uh, but, of course, it is important to point out um, that it wasn't really, I think, in my mind, one system over another prevailing inside of Syria. But largely, the reason why we have the situation that we have uh, is because of the military intervention by Iran, by Russia, and also, of course, by the United States in a very narrow way, as Fabrice has pointed out. Uh, in support of the YPG, and it's a real challenge. We are um, we are in the de facto partition um, um, uh, situation uh, that Fabrice uh, described, and the one that we were trying to deal with when he first uh, came to the institute. Uh, but uh, but of course, the degree to which um, the regime holds territory uh, is much larger um, than the fragmented scenario that we initially envisioned. Um, and there's a lot of questions, and I think most of my questions in reading Fabrice's book um, and, and, and looking at the maps very closely, I have to say I, I feel a little bit responsible for this book, um, not just because uh, Fabrice was my colleague, but because I had to answer a lot of questions from Mary, uh, who was making the maps when Fabrice wasn't here, and um, it, uh, it showed me actually the, the degree to which I don't know uh, about the sectarian uh, and, um, and geographical divide inside of Syria. Um, but, uh, but, you know, Mary and Fabrice work together very, in a very strong way to produce something that I think makes sense. So um, I have to um, 
uh, so I have a number of questions that I've generated from from reading the book. And so, um, first of all, to start out with, there was not there was a um, debate um, at the beginning of the war whether and for, and I think Patrick remembers this best uh, whether the regime would con, con, uh, would uh, collapse or whether it would contract. And this is one that Fabrice brings up very early in the book. And we had a we had a disagreement here at the institute. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, Jeff White. Um, thought that the regime was going to collapse and was on a trajectory to collapse. Uh, I did not think it would contr- collapse. I thought it would contract. Uh, I certainly um, uh, didn't uh, didn't want it to prevail. Um, but um, but in but you know the, the way I read this um, the way I read this book was really a, a um, was like a sort of blueprint or an analysis of why that collapse didn't occur and why the regime held on and then what can we do about it. So in a number of questions, and I'll, I'll just rattle them off, um, uh, one, two, three, four, five. So Fabrice, after reading your book, um, I agree with you that Western analysts and policymakers did not pay enough attention to sectarianism in, Sir- in Syrian society. And you mentioned in your study that the challenges, that it, you know, in your no- study challenges the notion that the regime, uh, quote, um, uh, the regime's efforts single-handed, single-handedly transformed the secular and democratic revolution of 2011 into the brutal sectarian conflict of today. And I, I, I take your point. But the regime's repeated uses of strategic weapons on its own people sort of, in my mind, took the divide and rule strategy or implementation of the Assad regime to a really truly new level. I mean, this wasn't um, even the use of artillery on Hama. This was um, a a sort of new low, so to speak. Um, And I just wonder out of all this, and this is my first question to you, was there a direct relationship between the tactics used on the battlefield using such strategic weapons and surges in sectarianism during the war? Okay, yes. First, um, the, um, the revolt was not democratic and secular everywhere. Uh, the, the in, uh, in Dera, okay, I said um, it was a revolt against uh, the dictatorship. It was n- no problem of, uh, of sectarian. But in Homs and uh, around Latakia, it was not the same thing. Uh, it was clearly anti Alawite uprising. Uh, um, in other place, uh, you had uh, or, or already Islamist and um, anti anti Shia feeling, anti uh, Christian feeling, uh, anti tribal feeling. Um, so it it was not only uh, in, in Damascus, in the center of Damascus. Okay, uh, the intellectual who, who, who demonstrate uh, were democratic and secular, but it was not the majority of the demonstrator. So it was easy for the regime to to use uh, uh, the sectarian uh, cleavage. Um, when it is the regime uh, repressed uh, the, the population brutally, uh, very uh, brutally, very strongly, um, he involved uh, the Alawite, he involved the, the minority who support him, who are in the army, in the repression. So you cannot come back. And the Sunni who are repressed by uh, the Arab Sunni who are repressed by the, by the regime uh, are are increasing their degree of, of violence too. And the, sorry, the, the sectarian solidarity is working. Um, so by uh, u- using uh, violence, uh, you can divide uh, very easily the population on the sectarian rules because people want to pay the price for the blood. The price of the blood is is very important in 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 Syria. If somebody from from your tribe is killed, you have to to venge. If somebody from your your community is killed, you have to venge. Okay. Um, second question: You point out the fragmented nature of the Syrian opposition um, and the various fact factors that led um, to uh, factional fight and the differences in the groups. Um, fighting Assad and how they were unable to agree on a national agenda. And I think um, that's, um, th- that's been pretty clear. Um, but I'm left a bit confused um, in terms of this, this uh, sectarian look at things. Um, um, I'm a bit confused um, why the Sunni divisions were so stark. Why, why were there so many different kinds of Sunni divisions within a majority Sunni population? So to what degree was it the regionalism of Sunnis in Syria, which I noticed during my time in Syria, that 
a, a Sunni from Dara might not be the same as a Sunni from Idlib in general or from yeah. one from Deir Zor, so on. Um, uh, or to what degree was it the policies of neighboring countries and regional sponsors who are often blamed for backing one group over another and creating Salafism where there was previously none? Well, the, it's simple because the Sunni Arab majority, uh, well, it's more easy to, to, to divide the majority. Uh, the minority are always more um, solidar. And um, Assad, uh, Afez al-Assad, since the beginning, uh, divided the, the, the Sunni. Um, he played uh, Damascus against Aleppo uh, during uh, 20 years, and when uh, when Damascus was uh, too strong, uh, Bashar al-Assad uh, reinforced Aleppo against Damascus, and you can do the same thing between Homs and Hama. Um, so it's it's very easy. Um, you play the bourgeoisie against uh, the work class. Um, the bourgeoisie uh, is afraid about uh, a social uh, uprising. Um, so at the regional level, uh, at the social level, you can easily divide the Sunni. You choose the Kurds I, like a uh, mufti of Damascus. Uh, he has no support from the from the local population. Why don't you choose uh, an Arab Sunni from Damascus to be the mufti? No, it's more easy to br to bring uh, to bring a Kurd. Uh, he will not have any support. And um, the strategy of Hafez al-Assad and after uh, Bashar al-Assad was all the time to, to divide the Sunni Arab majority uh, on, the, on the, the different terms. And moreover, after you have the Qatar who supports the Muslim Brothers, the Saudi Arabia who supports the Salafi, who introduce a competition between the different uh, uh, rebel groups uh, and, and put uh, oil on the, on the division fire. Okay. Um. As for your point about, quote, a large portion of Syria's population supporting Assad, whether out of self-interest, fear, or a combination of factors, um, I'm not sure I would use the word support here. Um, so given my conversations with Syrians, both before and after and during the war, um, I don't think Syrians support um, Assad in the full sense of the word, but I would use instead putting up with or tolerating Assad over another single national figure. Um, I, I think this, this um, uh, and we, we discussed this a little bit before the, uh, before the session, um, but, but it does leave me with a question uh, as to why. And so my question to you is, why did the, f the fear of the unknown in Syria, the unknown opposition or the unknown people that would take power, outweigh the fear of such slaughter, um, and one, one that you described in your book and we've described here at the Institute the last eight years? Well, you know, I think that something uh, is coming from the feeling that you have in whole dictature, uh, the, the fear of the unknown. I remember in 1953 when, when Stalin died, uh, you have millions of people in the street crying and they, they, they didn't know what would be the future. So uh, you have in, in, in all the dictature this fear of the, of the future if the leader uh, die. Uh, I remember when Hafez al-Assad died, in 2000, uh, people were uh, very afraid to, uh, about uh, the, the, the future. So it's the same thing um, at the beginning of the uprising. Many people don't want to take risk. The Syrians also are very uh, fatalist. Uh, the story of violence, of uh, coup d'etat, uh, show that uh, uh, you have a new leader, but the new leader is, is sometimes worse than the, the former. So why don't why don't change why you we change the leader, uh, Bashar al-Assad, the uh, Assad family, we know the family, we know who they are. The next one, we don't know. So we prefer to keep what we have than to, to go on the unknown. And um, there is support in the population. Uh, the Alawite, uh, not all the Alawite, but all the people who are very involved in the, uh, in the army, in the secret service, uh, support the regime because they benefit from the regime. And the other, as you say, uh, are putting up with the regime because of the fear of, uh, of the, um, the Sunni opposition, the Islamist opposition, and the uh, fear of the cow. Know what want the people today. It's peace and security, no more. Okay, um, so you know, throughout your book, um, pulling away a general theme here, you are arguing um, that the key to policy success for Iran and the regime in Syria was to follow a sectarian minority versus the factions of the Sunni majority sort of 
policy or scenario. Um, but I'm unclear at this point, you know, given, given everything that you've outlined here, what you think the West should do to achieve its policy objectives in Syria, being it making sure that ISIS doesn't return uh, or blocking Iran and, uh, in, in Syria and in the region. And to take it a little further, are you saying the U.S. and its allies should pick, should understand sectarianism in Syria, pick a sect and support them fully, um, which is the United States has been accused of recently in backing the SDF? Um, and if the U.S. wants more Sunni Arab support in Syria, um, does the U.S. need to do the same, i.e. pick a Sunni Arab uh, group uh, and stick with them to the end? I, I think that we, we have not to, to play a sect against another sect. We have to, to understand that there is a sectarian reality. And don't try to use a sect against another, but to try to, to take all the sect together and to be... Um, the premier, you said imperial? Yeah, um, umpire or referee, yeah. Yes, to give protection to everybody. Uh, why, uh, why in 2011, 2012, uh, we didn't succeed to attract the Alawite, the Christian, the minority in, in the uprising? Because they were afraid about the future, because we didn't, have give, we didn't give any guarantees to, to this minority about the future. And uh, we have, because m the problem of the understanding of the sectarianisms. In 2011-2012, most of the people say, no, there is no sectarian problem in Syria. It's, there is no sectarian problem in Syria. Or if there is a sectarian problem, it's Assad who creates the sect sectarianisms. No, it's not, it's not true. Because the problem that you have many people who deny the sectarianisms in the West or even um, Arabs uh, I I intellectual. It's probably for me the, the consequences of the uh, orientalism of, uh, of Edouard Said and um, of uh, his uh, ideology. Um, because if we, we have to take the sectarianism as a fact and to deal with that. Uh, and if we want uh, that the people uh, support the Western values, democracy, uh, etc. Uh, in, in the Middle East, don't play a sect against another, but be on the top. Okay. Um, still unclear about how you do that without picking it, it because I think, you, you know, you, you point out the success of Iran, Iran's strategy in Syria, and I'm, I'm not sure how in a sectarian environment you can succeed without picking a sect, but I'll, but I'll take your point. Um, so f fifth and final question, you also seem to argue in the book that the regime in Iran used the sectarian approach uh, to secure a part of Syria during the war and subsequently used the trappings of the Syrian state to bolster the idea that it was the inevitable winner in Syria as a whole. Um, but you do outline four scenarios at the end of your book um, that do take into account a de facto partition of Syria as possible. Given the regime's ability to hold on and recently expand with Iranian assistance, to what degree is a de facto partition of Syria now a necessity for the U.S. and Europe to achieve its policy objectives in Syria, be it Assad's departure or halting the spread of Iranian groups? Well, well, the, the partition of Syria, um, de facto partition of Syria is, is a reality because in northern Syria, uh, you have a different uh, ruler than in, in, in Damascus. Um, I think that uh, Idlib pocket uh, will be destroyed uh, after a few months, so we don't have any, uh, will not have any Sunni um, uh, opposition anymore in uh, in Syria, uh, inside Syria. Uh, you just will will just have the uh, the PYD uh, in northern Syria controlling the north with the support of uh, of US, but until when? That's uh, the, the main question, uh, because with the, the war, the new context of the war between uh, between Turkey and, and the Kurds, uh, U.S. are in a very uncomfortable um, uh, situation. Um, and if uh, if U.S. don't say uh, stop to Erdogan, uh, I think that the Kurds will switch their alliance uh, very soon. Um, and. Uh, as I, s I have seen in, in northern Syria, uh, people say to me, most of the people, most of the Arab people say to me, we want a state. Uh, we are fed up of the war. We, w we don't want to fight for the Kurds. Uh, we want a state. What does it mean? Uh, we want the regime come back if there is no improvement. Um, 
So the, the, the partition of Syria, I think it's, uh, it's, it's finished, except if U.S. Uh, are more involved uh, in, in northern Syria and uh, create a kind of Marshall Plan to help the North Syria and uh, to, to have the means to stay in, in, in the north and to have a, a leverage on, on, on Damascus. But if the uh, uh, U.S. don't do that, uh, uh, I think it's finished. We will have de facto autonomy uh, for the Kurds in the north because the regime is going to deal with them. Um, you, you, you put the Syrian flag uh, close to the Kurdish flag uh, and we share the authority and uh, you, you will speak Kurds and we will keep your weapon because uh, I need also a leverage against Erdogan. I don't want to kill you. Um, in some place, you will have some uh, local autonomy, like in the Jebel Druze, because the Druze have been loyal to the regime. So in exchange, they will have some, some freedom. Um, but uh, nothing, nothing written, uh, nothing in the Constitution, of course. Uh, informal, uh, informal uh, local, uh, local autonomy. Um, for the future, uh, after 10 years, 20 years, I don't know what will happen, but the division of, uh, of the Middle East, the fragmentation of the Middle East is still uh, real. There is still the, the threat. Um, uh, I don't know if it's a, how, how to, to make peace in the area by keeping the St. Pico uh, state order or by uh, creating a new uh, state order? It's a, it's a big question. Uh, you, you can solve some problem, but you can create new problem. I think that the solution is by changing the the culture of the population to reduce the weight of the sectarianism, if it's possible, uh, than trying to, to, to cut, uh, to cut the, the actual state. We have seen that happen in, in Sudan um, with the south and the north, so I don't know if it's a very, very good, uh, good solution. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah. So now you get to ask your questions, but first I get uh, the pleasure of being the moderator to ask uh, my, my question. Uh, we actually have not heard very much from you about um, the attitudes of different groups in Syria towards the Iranians and their proxies and towards the Russians. Could you talk a bit about um, how you think, how well, how well have they played their hand in this sectarian conflict, and um, how these uh, sectarian divisions have uh, have wor worked for them? Mm. Well, of course, uh, the, the the Iranian uh, succeed in the East because um, they support the Shia minorities in Iraq, in uh, in Lebanon, and and in Syria. But it's not enough because uh, the, my, the Shia are minorities in uh, in the area. So they try to attract also the other minorities, like the Christian in Lebanon, uh, to to explain them that the, uh, the Hezbollah is protecting the Christian against Daesh, against uh, the, the Salafists. And uh, for uh, many people, it's working. Uh, it's working. Um, they try also to to divide the Sunni and to attract the part of the Sunni. Uh, so they play the sectarian game, uh, but they don't um, necessarily exclude the Arab Sunni from uh, from their governance. Where the people are not loyal, of course they exclude them, but uh, in the other place uh, they integrate them in uh, in their um, in their power, and uh, they um, they give them advantage. For instance, um, the Sunni business class in Syria. Uh, will be very happy to have access to the Iraqian market in the future. Uh, but if you want to have access to the Iraqian market, you have to be loyal to Assad. You have to be loyal uh, and you have to have close, close link with, um, with the, the Shia militia in, uh, in Iraq. What does it mean to, to give a percentage uh, to, to the Shia militia, for instance? Um, so the Iranians have, uh, have the means to, uh, uh, to, uh, to be the, the, master, the master of the game uh, using sectarianisms, 
but without excluding um, without excluding uh, a sect, uh, just trying to to keep some equilibrium equality between uh, between the the people. Uh, but of course, the Shia will be the more um, privileged uh, community because uh, they, they trust more the Shia than the other. And any comments about the Russians? Well, the Russian, um, the Russian, since the beginning, Russia had a clear uh, understanding of the uh, sectarian uh, reality of Syria. If you took, um, if you take the, the Russian newspaper, the Russian magazine in 2011, 2012, it was full of uh, sectarian maps of Syria. Uh, in the Western newspaper, it was very, very difficult to find uh, any sectarian maps of, of the Syrian conflict because we didn't want to see the sectarian reality. Um, and uh, that's w because the Russian understood very well how Syria was working. Um, that's why the, 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 their operation succeed. Uh, in 2015, they tried to clientelize uh, the uh, the Alawite because if we we say that the Alawite are Shia, yes, uh, officially they are they belong to the Shia family, but the Alawite believe in the reincarnation, so it's not very uh, Muslim and it's not very Shia. Uh, the the, the sh twelve uh, Shia twelve think that the, the Alawite are. Uh, Kafir, or Kafir in English. Uh, <laughs> Un unbeliever. Unbe unbeliever, yes. Um, s and the Alawite drink alcohol, uh, the women don't have any hijab, uh, so uh, um, they are more close to the, the Russian way, way of life than the Iranian way of life. Uh, so the, um, uh, the Russian try to attract the Alawite, that's why they put their military base in, in Latakia, in Tartus, uh, and Jable, because they feel um, secure in, in this environment. And um, they, uh, they, they, they support, of course, the, the, the new Alawite uh, political opposition, uh, what we call the Himimin opposition. They try to find in the Alawite community some uh, uh, people able to challenge a little bit the, the, the regime. Um, the Russian also try to support the Kurds. Uh, the goal of the of Moscow is to attract uh, the PYD uh, on his side um, because there is no Kurds in Russia, so he has no problem of uh, of Kurdish uh, uh, identism, uh, Kurdish um, fragmentation, like the Iranian, for instance. Um, and um, you have all the uh, all link between the PKK and, 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 and Soviet Union, so we can also use this old uh, old um, link. Um, and all the people who are um, secular in all the in all the the sect uh, in the Sunni, in the Druze, in the in the Christian uh, Christian uh, world also, the Christian society in Syria. You have many people who are secular. And uh, they prefer the Russian secularism to the uh, Iranian um, um, uh, theocracy. Uh, Andrew, I, I would just add to that. Um, I mean, I, I I agree, and I think um, F Fabrice is right in that the certainly my interaction with Russian academics and those who uh, at a similar time did fully account for as as we had here in the West that maps of the opposition areas did depict not only the sectarian, w the original sectarian mosaic of the country, but also where the different sectarian base groups were located. And there it got into a conversation about terrorists versus, uh, uh, terrorists versus uh, other rebels and so on. Now, the, the flip side of that, of course, was, and this is something I, maybe I learned in the process, was that I, I did notice, though, that, the, that both the Russians and also Westerners as well tended to neglect the role of... Um, of uh, Shia militia and Iranian-backed militia in the maps showing regime areas. Um, and, uh, and I think it's, you know, partially it's a result, of course, of the Russian media being uh, not the most open in the world and, and, and so on, because, um, but, but also I think it's, it's to, the, to the point that sometimes maps reflect what it is we would like to see. And, um, and I'm wondering, and I, I still wonder to this day, in fact, it's a project that, um, Jackson here, who is uh, in his last week as being the uh, an RA here in the department, he supported both Fabrice and I over the last year. 
um, has been having um, the um, the uh, tough duty of trying to map out a lot of the location of a lot of these Shia militia uh, throughout the um, dom- red dominated areas where the Assad regime is located. And uh, it is a extremely diverse um, uh, mosaic, um, in in some cases as mo- as diverse as the opposition areas. Um, and I think that's one thing that both sides, no matter who, whether uh, no matter who you're betting on in the Syrian war, we have to be better about how accurate these maps are, where these groups are, who's supporting these groups, if we are really to try and reverse um, the fragment fragmentation inside of. Um, uh, Syria. And in that sense, it's, you know, we, we really can't leave a place that we've never been. And so I think in, in order to, to get to that understanding, we do need to be better at that, uh, that kind of uh, the producing those kind of maps. Thank you. Questions? I'm sure we've answered everything. Oh, look at the hands up. How disturbing. Really? <laughs> right there in the middle, please. I, I, there's a microphone coming your way, I believe, uh, right uh, there. And if you could start by telling us your name. Yeah, shout. Okay, uh, Greg Aftandillion with American University. My question is, uh, Reese, thank you for your presentation. I'm curious about uh, whether the, um, how the ir- Iraqi sectarian violence may have influenced the thinking of the minority groups in Syria. In other words, um, si- since 2003, for example, at least two-thirds of the Christian population of Iraq has left the country. So did that, in your mind, um, impact how uh, the fear, of, say, of the Christians and other minorities vis-a-vis the, the rebel camp, did that have this, that impact? Thank you. Uh, yes, of course. Um, uh, for the Christian, uh, the, the Iraqi example was very strong uh, because also you have uh, a lot of Cri- Iraqi Christians who, who fled through Syria and through Lebanon. And so uh, they can explain to the, the Christian in Syria and Lebanon uh, what was the situation in Iraq. So uh, the Christian didn't want to uh, to have the same uh, the same future as the Iraqi uh, Christian. But 50% of the Christian have left Syria at, uh, today. Um, for the uh, for the Alawite and the other minorities. It was the same thing because uh, the uh, the strong um, terrorism, al- uh, Al-Qaeda terrorism against the Shia, uh, car bomb, uh, uh, show uh, that could be the future uh, uh, of, uh, of the minority in Syria if the uh, Al-Qaeda succeed in, uh, in Syria. And since the beginning, of course, uh, Assad regime said that uh, the Free Syrian Army, uh, the rebellion, uh, it was Al-Qaeda. Or everything was Al-Nusra. Uh, but does it mean Al-Qaeda? Yeah, right here in front. Hi, Sarah Stern from the Endowment for Middle East Truth. Um, One cannot help but appreciate your wonderful um, understanding of the cultural mosaic of Syria. Um, And uh, it's it's very beneficial for all of us, so thank you to hear this. Um, However, your prescription of America protecting every single minority um, seems to um, neglect the fact that Iran um, has hegemonic aspirations and has been taking over, you know, trying to take over Damascus, Beirut, Sarna, and um, sometimes we have to protect our national security interests as well. Yes, of course. Uh, but um, if we want, uh, if U.S. want to protect uh, uh, its security, uh, I think it's by preventing Iran to <laughs> to progress in in the Middle East. And we have to understand why Iran is able to uh, to develop in Middle East. And uh, in, in and Syria is a good example. It's because at the beginning of the uprising. Uh, we're denying the reality of the sectarianism. We're denying, uh, we have denied uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the fear of the minority that the regime succeed and no Syria is a stronghold of Iran. And I don't, say, I don't say that U.S. has to protect only the minority. It has to protect everybody, even the majority. 
Uh, but not playing a sect against another sect, but be try to, to, to be equal with everybody. Andrew? I, I would just add t to that. I, I think I would go to, I, b I believe, it was, well, I've heard it most discussed by Henry Kissinger, but, <coughs> so, and, I, and I'm paraphrasing here, but the, the secret to Iran's success in the region, and it's important that we understand its success in the region and what it's doing, is its ability to prop up rickety states. Right? It is a huge problem, right? Because if they were propping up a, a stable uh, state in the in the the sense we understand it, then we wouldn't have this degree of bloodshed, refugees, um, uh, terrorism, sectarianism, and so on. But the particular way, and I think this is what the Trump administration sort of gets at in terms of the nefarious activities of the Iranians in the region, um, uh, beyond the the. Um, support for no, non-state actors and, and U.S. designated terrorist organizations, okay, but um, to, to, to the point, their ability to prop up these rickety states is, is particularly challenging. Um, and, um, but as Fabrice's book, I think, points out, they do, they and their clients do so um, uh, in, a, in a brutal and skillful way. It, the, the, it does beg the question, what can the, what can the United States and its allies do to uh, provide an alternative. And I think that's the real challenge um, for U.S. policy at the moment, is trying to, you know, what can, you know, Fabrice pointed out that if we really su expect to succeed in eastern Syria, we're going to have to dump a lot of money into those areas to provide an alternative, um, which has been described in policy circles as the example of uh, East Germany versus West Germany or East Berlin versus West Berlin. Um, but, uh, but, you know, implementing that, I think, is another, is a, is, is a, is a huge challenge. And right behind, second row back. Uh, <coughs> Roy Gutman, I'm a journalist. Uh, Fabrice, I found your presentation really fascinating and, and really helpful. <coughs> but I was uh, very intrigued by, by your immediate experience <coughs> in the last uh, month in Monbij <coughs> and in Raqqa, um, and your prediction that the regime will be brought back because uh, YPG has basically failed <coughs> to govern properly or, or to, to give sufficient rights to the locals. Um, and it raises a question about U.S. policy. I mean, I'm not sure how confident you can be about U.S. policy, because do you suppose that this was the aim of the United States in supporting <coughs> the uh, SDF in the capture of, of Monbij <coughs> and the capture of uh, Raqqa? I mean, did the U.S. Have a, uh, have a goal as to who was going to take over and what governance would consist of <coughs> after the conquest occurred? Um, when when I came to to, to Raqqa and uh, and Manbej, um, I was very surprised because I, I thought that I will find uh, I will find U.S. aid, I will find uh, many economic help uh, on, on the ground. Nothing, nothing, nearly nothing. Uh, MSF was very implant. French doc it, it doctor was very doctors uh, are uh, w but uh, it's a uh, European NGO, uh, and they have no support from the U U.S. government. Um, and the people are very upset about that because uh, the economic situation I is a disaster because of the bad management of the, the PYD, who is unable to, to improve the, the, the local economy uh, because of the war, but also because of uh, the Ocalan ideology. Um, so uh, if U.S. Uh, are not able to, to, to help uh, the, the population, the, the population uh, will, m will make very easily the comparison w with what, what's happened in Damascus, in Aleppo, where you have full electricity, where you have education, when you are health, where the bread is cheaper, where the fuel is cheaper. Uh, um, and uh, most of the Arab people say, me, we want the state come back. Uh, because there is no state here. Um, we want services. Just after uh, the, the, the liberation of Mount Beige, people were very, hap were very happy uh, about the SDF because we liberated the city. But one year after the liberation, there is no improvement. And people are fed up. They see in Aleppo there is electricity, there is education. They want the same thing. And um, the YPG is not able to provide that. 
uh, and uh, no, they, they, uh, they, they want uh, the Syrian state come back. The only solution uh, is to, like on Rousseau's side, to do what we have uh, U.S. done after the Second World War, a Marshall Plan, and develop, develop West Germany <laughs> to show that East Germany uh, was collapsed. Uh, right there and back. Thank you. Alan Makovsky, Center for American Progress. Fabrice, good to see you again. Uh, could you say a word about what you found among the population of Manbij regarding the prospect of the Turks taking over? Um, mm -hmm. And secondly, if I could, could you also say a word about the Suryani group that is the ostensible partner of the Kurds in the project of uh, the uh, Federation for Northern Syria. Which group? Suryani, the uh, uh, Syria, uh, Syria, Syria Christian. Mm. Sorry. Okay. Um, the the population of Manbij don't want uh, the Turk uh, in Manbij. They don't want the Turk because the Turks for them it's the Free Syrian Army, and everybody say me the, the worst time for us in Manbij, it was when the Free Syrian Army was ruling the city. Because they were uh, kidnapping people, they were uh, stalling everything, uh, we had no electricity, no rule in the city, each neighborhood you had uh, a militia. So uh, they don't want to, uh, to come back to the same, uh, to the same situation. Uh, they, they don't like uh, particularly Erdogan, uh, so, um, sorry? No, they will not resist, uh, of course. Uh, but for instance, the, the Arabs who are in the SDF, uh, they are in the SDF just for the salary, because the, the economic situation is so bad that it's the only solution for you to survive. Uh, but they don't want to, to fight. Uh, with the Kurds against the Turks. Uh, no, they will come back to their tribe and to, <laughs> to stay at home, uh, waiting who is going to, to, to win uh, the, the, the battle. So the, the Syriac. Uh, you know, the Christians are very few uh, in, uh, in northeast Syria, no? Uh, more than 50% left the, the area. Um, they... Oh, uh, with the Kurds, there, there, there is no, no, no problem, there is protection, uh, okay. Uh, but um, they are not so enjoyed with the, the Kurdish leadership, too. Um, because um, um, uh, they accuse the, the Kurds to, to stall their lands. Um, in, uh, it was not the Syriac, but it was more the Assyrian, uh, close to Tel Tamer. I visited Tel Tamer, uh, where you have the uh, Assyrian villages. Uh, 30,000 people were living in this area until 2015, and now there is nobody, because Daesh took the area, and uh, now they are in Australia, Canada, Suez, and they will never come back. And uh, the, 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 the Assyrian accused the Kurds to have let uh, the Kurds to take, to, to have let Daesh to take the area to expel the Christian and after to settle Kurdish uh, family uh, on, on the area. So um, they are not supporting uh, fully the, 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 the Kurdish leadership. In Kamishli, uh, Al Usta, uh, the, uh, the central neighborhood of Kamishli, which is uh, the Christian area, is under the control of the Sotoro. Sotoro, what does it mean? The pro, uh, the pro uh, regime militia. You have Sotoro in Hasake, uh, officially the Syriac militia. But uh, when I visited Hasake and the headquarters of the, of the Sotoro, I saw that 90% of the, the people were Muslim and not Christian. So the, um, the support, uh, the Christian support to the Kurds is very weak. They, they would prefer the regime because at the time of the regime, the Christian in Kamishli and Hasake has a much more better situation than today. Dan Lieberman, I'm a writer. Uh, to enlarge a point that was said before, uh, 
Uh, we have Iran establishing bases in Syria and greatly reinforcing Hezbollah, which is certainly lobbying to Israel as well as the United States. Won't there be a point at which Israel will have to react? And do you have any idea of what its reaction will be? Uh, I think that uh, bon, since the beginning of the conflict, uh, Israel had uh, two red lines. Uh, if uh, if the, uh, Israel is targeted by, uh, by something coming from Syria, we don't know if it's the opposition, if it's the regime, uh, if it's a mistake or not, uh, they, they react uh, and they, they bomb uh, the place uh, uh, where, um, uh, where the, the, the shelling came. Um, they destroy, they, Israel destroyed also all the tentative of um, Hezbollah implementation installation in, in the Golan, and like we have seen uh, when they killed uh, Samir Kantar in, uh, in, in Jeremana. Um, and I think that for Israel, it's still the same, uh, the same policy. It's try to, to, to prevent uh, the uh, Iranian and Hezbollah progress in, uh, in Syria. Um, but how, how to react uh, more strongly, I don't know, um, without any uh, American support. Uh, I don't, I, um, frankly, I, I don't know uh, what Israel could do in, in such situation. Okay, and down here in front, in the middle. Thank you. Uh, George Bailey with the Lebanese Information Center. Based on your analysis, do you advocate a federal system for the, as a political solution for Syria? A federal system in so fragmented uh, country, that does it mean partition? Um, everywhere where you have a frag fragmented uh, sectarianism, like in Syria, the federation will not work. It will be better to have a huge decentralization at the level of the city, the municipality, because even if you make a, des uh, a feder federation in northern Syria, for instance, or in Hasake province, the Kurds are going to oppress the, the Christian and, and the Arabs. On the other, on the other place, uh, it will be the Arab who will oppress the Kurds. And so uh, it's not a good solution. It's, it's better to have a secular state and at the local level, autonomy for the, for the city, for the village, because it's at the, this level that the people, that you, you, you have a sectarian homogeneity. Uh, and where the, the neighbor relations are better. Um, because between neighbor, even if you are Christian, Muslim, very uh, um, uh, understanding. Uh, it's when you have people coming from another area that the sectarian, the, the sectarian violence starts. Uh, it's not between neighbor. So um, I advocate more for a, a unified secular state and local autonomy, very local autonomy. Interesting. Over here, please. Uh, if we want to keep Syria unified uh, after, uh, if we want the, the, the fragmentation of the country, yes, do federalism. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lauren Homer. Thank you so much, Fabrice, for your remarks. Even though they're a little depressing, my concern has been trying to develop a secular state through the, uh, the work that's being done in northeastern Syria and the areas controlled by the SDF. But I wondered if you could focus on Afrin for a moment, which seems to be almost like a little play of all of the uh, different geopolitical forces that are operating to possibly completely destabilize Syria once again uh, with a Turkish invasion and threats to invade the entire swath of area controlled by the SDF all the way to Iraq. Uh, what do you see as a solution there? What do you think the U.S. and NATO should do to, to stop uh, Turkey's aggression, if possible? Um, what's happened in Afrin uh, was, was expected. Uh, it's, uh, we know that uh, Erdogan uh, will never accept uh, the YPG in northern Syria. And so uh, he decided to target Afrin because uh, it's not, uh, there is no American troops. Uh, 
So uh, because he don't want he don't want to take the risk to kill American soldier. Uh, so he decided to to target uh, Afrin. He asked the permission to to Putin, and Putin said yes, yes, of course. Uh, after the Tiersen discourse, we are going to stay in Syria. We are going to to create uh, a force in northern Syria. Um, Putin give him give to Erdogan the green line to attack Afrin. Uh, but I think it's um, it's Kurdish stronghold. Ninety five percent of the population is is, uh, is Kurdish. It's also uh, historically a stronghold of the PKK. Fifty percent of the um, of the fighter of the PKK Syrian of the. Uh, PKK Syrian fighter were from Afrin, even if it's only 150,000 people. So 10 percent of the Kurdish population of Syria. Um, and now the, 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 the officer, the quadro, the PKK quadro, PPK, PKK uh, YPG, um, quadro YPG were in, uh, in, in northern Syria, more than 50 percent of them are from Afrin. So Afrin is very, very important. For uh, for the PYD and for the PKK, and they will uh, defend uh, Afrin very uh, very strongly. The consequence the consequence it's that the Kurds say, uh, oh, we 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 took Raqqa for you, we we destroyed Daesh for you, and now uh, you let the the Turk uh, destroy us. So please do something because uh, they will fight, but without uh, with light uh, weapon, they will not resist uh, more than six months. So they are uh, today the PYD, the YPG are dealing with Moscow, with uh, with Iran. Okay, um, what do you want against uh, war protection? And if US don't succeed to stop Turkey quickly, I'm sure that the Kurds will switch their alliance. And uh, they will let the Syrian army to, to come back to Afrin, to, to Manbej, to, to Raqqa, in action of the Russian protection. And Moscow don't want to, to destroy the PYD. He wants to keep the PYD half alive as a leverage on Turkey. Because the relation uh, between Turkey and, and, and Russia is not based on trust, on, but on, on interest and on leverage. So um, uh, when... Um, when uh, the PID and uh, the, the Russian will have an agreement, Putin will say stop to, to Erdogan. And the day after, you will have a demonstration in front of the military base in, uh, in, uh, in the Kurdish area. U.S. go home. And what will happen at that moment? Well, I think uh, on that optimistic Patrick. note... Uh, <laughs> Patrick, Patrick <laughs> Mono Yukubian in the back. Ah, Mono Yukubian in the back. I'm sorry. Missed you. One last question, Mona. Thanks very much, Mona Yakubian from USIP. Fabrice, you touched on initially this idea of demographic reengineering. Um, you mentioned, for example, in Qusair, where uh, Iranians and Shias are settling in that area. How extensive is this issue of demographic reengineering? Um, how durable is it? What's what's the overall impact that you see? And, and is it just the regime, or are there others that are doing it as well? Well, demography, uh, I need uh, two hours to explain the, <laughs> the demography of, of Syria, but it's very, very important. Um, we have to know that uh, the, the minority in Syria, Druze, Alawite, Christian, in 1980, it was 30% of the population. In 2011, it was only 20% of the population because of uh, the difference between the fertility rates. And uh, that's why also the, the Assad regime was not able to repress quickly uh, the, the demonstration because he didn't have enough enough uh, forces. Uh, the Alawite uh, were not enough to, to repress uh, the, the uprising. And that's why he, he bring a Shia militia uh, because without the, the help of the Shia militia, I, I'm sure that he will not have uh, retake uh, Aleppo. Um, and uh, retake uh, eastern eastern Syria. So demography is Im is important because it gives you the force, uh, the force of the of the repression. Um, in Qusair, uh, uh the uh, the Sunni population uh, is not welcome to come back, <laughs> if I can say that like that, because um, it's a very strategic place for for the Iranian. And also for the Hezbollah and for the Syrian regime, because they want to break the uh, 
potential uh, SUNY hacks between Tripoli and, and Homs. And uh, it's the only place where it's possible to, to, break, uh, to break it. And uh, we have to remember that Cosser was a stronghold of the opposition. Uh, most of the, um, the foreigners coming fr from Lebanon to Syria came to Cosser, and many Lebanese from Tri Tripoli, from Baptebane, uh, for instance, came to Cosser. So uh, Cosser now is nearly empty uh, about the, um, the Sunni population. So you have some place like that, some crossroad in Damascus, some cross neighbor in Aleppo, where there is a, a demographic change re-engineering the population, but at very, very local scale, because it's not possible to change. Uh, it's not possible. It's not so impossible uh, to change uh, the demography, because uh, we have already 7 million of Syrian refugees. I'm sure that uh, most of them will never come back to Syria. Uh, of course, 80% uh, of these refugees are Sunni, Arab Sunni. Um, in Idlib, uh, we have two million of people uh, with the fight. Probably one million of people uh, will try to, to escape to, to Turkey, and they are Sunni. So Assad can r try to reduce the weight of the Sunni population, and the, the Sunni population who is, no, who is not loyal to him, because you have many Sunni who are loyal, who belong to tribe, loyal to, uh, to the, the regime, like the Hamadani uh, tribe close to, to Hama. Um, but you will not uh, reinverse uh, re the, the. You will not uh, change hundred percent the population. It's not, it's not possible. But I think it's a strategy on long term uh, in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, um, because um, um, if the Iranian crescent, um, the Iranian crescent need to have some Shia pocket everywhere to to control the area. Well, I'm afraid on that long-term note, we'll have to have a short-term end. Mm -hmm. And uh, please do pick up a copy outside, and for Fabrice will be out there in a moment or two to uh, sign them if you'd like, have, like to have a signed copy. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Fabrice, good luck. <laughs>